Esther chapter 2. As we are looking in your Bibles, we're seeing several different uh, things come up in Esther um, that will, while the name of God is never mentioned, and it, and it has been mentioned that uh, the Song of Solomon does not explicitly uh, name God either, but we know that it is God's Word, and I'm, I'm going to check out some more of that here before long just to do my homework, if you would, on... Uh, on really where things uh, lay in that regard. Does it mean it's not the Word of God? No, not at all. It is clearly the Word of God. And as we come in today, I, wanna, I want us to look at Esther. And you may never have read the book of Esther as we're going to study today. Uh, but I want you to be good students to really look into our context of what is going on. You know, we need to remember, and I've titled this me message, The Cinderella Draft. Okay, this is not a beauty pageant. This is not cute. It's not even that nice. It's a draft. It's a conscription. And so as this is starting to t unfold, um, a few years ago there was a contest in Afghanistan that uh, dressed up and all in their burqas. They were having a beauty contest so that these ladies could have a shot at the movie industry that was just starting in Afghanistan as they tasted newfound freedom. But, you know, I want to ask you, would you like your daughter to be a model? I would, I would hope that none of you would say yes. Uh, it is, it's not the life. And as I, I personally know a Miss Teen, and I won't mention the state, um, and uh, it, it didn't do her life well. Um, yeah, she was beautiful on the outside, but it led her down some really not so good paths. Um, it led into things that were inappropriate. You know, we live in a, in a world, same with an actor. Some of that is, we have to be careful what it is that we encourage our kids to do. Now, maybe local theater was something that's clean or whatever. Oh, that's fine. It could be great, fun. It could be using some of their talent. But some of us that our world advertises uh, we have to be careful. You know what one of the problems is? We get impressed with our world. We're impressed with, whoa, Hollywood. Wow, Los Angeles. Wow, New York. Wow, the big screen. We get wowed by our world. You know what the beginning of Esther is? Esther chapter 1, the king throws a huge feast that's a, six months long. What a feast is that? His wife, Vashti, throws a huge feast, and then he throws a drunken feast for seven days. And all of this going on, you see why? He did it to show off the glory of his kingdom. He is what king? He's the king over 127 provinces. This guy's big stuff. He's a big deal. And you and I can get impressed. Wow! From Kush or Ethiopia, which would be modern day northern part of uh, e Egypt, all the way over to the what was now, is said India in our, pac our passage, it would be what's now Pakistan, right along the edge of India. And you see all this and like, wow, what an incredible display of power. What an impressive king. What an impressive kingdom. You know, as we look at things, we need to be careful that we remember, too, as we look into our context, the world can be impressive to us. As we're going back to the time of Esther, we're going back, if you would, some 2,500 years ago. Remember that they were taken in exile from the land of Israel, and they have been in captivity for a little over a hundred years at this time. Uh, what is it, how does that saying go? When in Rome, do what? Ooh, do as the Romans do. Do you think that ever happened for the Jews? While in Babylon, do what the Babylonians do. While in Persia, do it. Now, there were true, strong Jewish believers in that time. We look at Daniel, who would not capitulate, who would not eat the king's food. We looked at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which is their Babylonian names. But as they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't bend, they would not burn, because God was with them. 
We look at these characters and like, wow, they were godly individuals. Remember, though, those were the godly ones who had just been arrested as godly teenagers. They just got out of youth group. They were robbed from the youth group in Israel, taken out to Babylon some 900 some miles away, and they are there. But you know what's not going well? These are foreign gods, that idol-loving gods, and they asked them to do all kinds of evil things. And, and they said, would you test our God? And that's where we find Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's at the beginning of the captivity. At the end of the captivity... Do you remember Zerubbabel? Before, as we get into Esther, Ezra and Nehemiah are happening at the same time. We've got some overlap here. And just a few years earlier, Zerubbabel has taken 50,000 people back. They returned to the land of Israel. They were the faithful, like, we are pro-Israel, this is the promised land, we're going to establish worship in the temple and do what's right. But you know what's sad? Hundreds of thousands of Jews remained in Babylon. It remained, really, now Persia, because Babylon has been conquered by Persia in one day. And this is all taking place, fulfilling some of the things that God had said in the book of Daniel. Well, as this is all taking place, you, you almost have to beg the question, is Esther and Mordecai, are Esther, Esther and Mordecai, are they godly individuals or are they compromised? I think the broader question is, are the Jews who have remained, are they compromised? Have they become complacent in the culture in which they live? You know, as we go through, we do not see Esther distinctively keeping kosher laws. We do not see, she, we see her eating all that's put, put before her from what we can tell in the passage, in the beauty treatments and the like. We do not see her being distinctively Jewish. Instead, she's to hide her identity. Now, is that prudence? Or is it compromise? We don't know the answer to that question, but it's a question that is to be asked with the known that you don't have a for sure answer. And so keep some of that in mind. There are times with Mordecai where he shows to be very godly. I mean, he will not bow uh, to Haman. He will not compromise godly convictions at the gate. Yet there's other things that just don't smell totally right. It's why a lot of pastors and uh, over the years have refused to preach the book because they don't know what to do with these two heroes of the Old Testament. Can I have a spoiler alert? Believers are messy of all ages. They're sinners. I don't know how many times I've found people that don't like David at all. I'm like, you kidding me? He's my favorite character. Yeah, but he sinned with Bathsheba. I'm like, yeah, that was one sin. And, and it was bad. But, seriously, he's the one of the only ones who is a man after, who is called in the Bible a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he would repent of his sin. Uh, we almost act like all the heroes of the Old Testament need to be polished and spotless. Well, they should have been, but they're sinners. And you and I need to remember that was a level of understanding as we go through life not to write people off because of a sin or their compromises. God knows where they were faithful. And so please keep some of those things in mind. Turn in your Bibles to chapter 2 if you're not there already. And let's begin in verse 1 and read to the end of the chapter, verse 23. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti what he had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins of Shushan the citadel and into the women's quarters under the custody of Hegai, the, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women. And let beautiful uh, preparations 
beauty preparation, sorry, be given to them. And let the young women who please the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. In Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew who was named Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, when the many young women were gathered at Shushan the citadel under the custody of Haggai, Haggai the that Esther also was taken to the king's palace into the care of Haggai and the custodian of the women. Now, the young woman pleased him and she obtained his favor. So she readily gave beauty preparations to her. He gave beauty preparations to her be besides her allowance. Then seven choice maiden, maid servants were provided for her from the king's palace and he moved her and the maid servants to the best place in the house of the women. Verse 10, Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. Each young woman's turn came to go into the king Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months of preparation according to the regulations for women, for thus were the days of their preparations appointed. Six months with oil of myrrh, six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared each woman according. Each young woman went to the king and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. And in the evening she went and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women to the custody of Shahazgez, the king king's eunuch who kept the concubines. She would not go in to the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. Now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abigail, the uncle of Mordecai who had, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. And Esther was taken to the king Ahasuerus into his royal palace into the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women. She obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her king instead of Ashti. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all of his servants, officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. When virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people just as Mordecai had charged her for Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she had was brought up by him in those days when Mordecai sat within the king's gate two of the king's eunuchs Big Fan and Teresh doorkeepers became furious and sought to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus so the matter became known to Mordecai who told Queen Esther and Esther informed the king of Mordecai Mordecai's name. And when the inquiry had, was made into the matter, it was confirmed and both were hanged on a gallows. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Let's pray. Lord God, would you please help us to look into this text, help us to understand it. Lord, I do not want to create a narrative that's not there. So help us to derive what is here and help us to be your good students. May you be worshipped, loved, and adored. In Jesus' name. 
Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is honestly a little bit of a hard passage to think. What do you preach out of this passage? And so, as I try to derive what is the main theme, I try to look for repeated words. There is one phrase I keep on finding in this. Verse 9, she obtained favor. It's the word chesed. Now, you normally hear me use that word to mean loyal love. In this case, it's kindness. It's grace. And here we see she obtained favor favor, kindness, grace. Look over in uh, end of verse 15, and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. Verse 17, the king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace. Now, this is not chesed. It's the word chen, H-E-N, with a little dot under the H. It has the idea of uh, just, just our normal understanding of grace, favor, kindness. And then the second word is favor is chesed, which is kindness and favor. She, she received lots of grace. Do you see God moving in the background? Yes. God is sovereign. This is a book, while God's name is never mentioned, he is the silent mover and actor behind all of the scenes. And so we see this taking place in ways that are just kind of mind-blowing. There's no way this could happen without God being in them. You know, but we then have to ask the question, it doesn't seem quite right that she takes all the, she eats of the king's food, she, she's a secret believer, she suppresses things, but at the same time, you and I have to ask, what about Nicodemus, who took the body of Jesus, who is called a secret disciple, and Joseph of Arimathea? What do you do with those two men in the gospel account? Joseph of Arimathea uh, taking, helping with the body. If you remember Nicodemus coming in the night in John 3, as well as the end of uh, the gospel account. And you're just like, wow, what do I do with this? We know that I should not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God. I, I shouldn't be ashamed. Yet, is this a wisdom issue or is this a compromise issue? We don't totally have the answer. But re here's an application for you. You know, can God, can compromise believers be used by God? Absolutely. God can use donkeys, my friend. He can use compromised believers. He can use unbelieving pagan kings and has throughout all history. The question really should be, should you obey? Yes. Okay. Be careful of making God needy. This is the problem. As Christians, we do something. Parents, don't ever do this. Don't tell your kids, God needs you to obey. No! God is not needy. He doesn't need you to obey. You should obey. You want to do it from the heart. God doesn't depend on your obedience. Like, oh man, I just blew my plans. Do you see God wringing his hands in heaven? Man, they really messed up this time. We act that way, but God does not act that way. He knows every purported course of action. Remember what Jesus said to Capernaum. Had the things been done in you that were done, had they been done, Capernaum, entire inside, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. God knows every course, and he's still in control. Keep those things in mind. You know, heroes, yes, might have some questionable um, uh, morality in some of these things, but that's just a question mark. Can God use sinners? Of course he can. God's sovereign. He is your God. So, as we come through this chapter, here's my question leading into the proposition. How, should, how do you need, you need to view God in the midst of your sin and the midst of other people's sin? How do you view God when people sin, when you sin? Well, here is my answer. Um, as we look to our proposition, you need to trust that God's purposes are not messed up by sinners. That's what you need to do. How do you view sin and sinners? God's not messed up by this. God is not caught off guard. Instead, 
they're utilized in God's gracious control. Hallelujah. God's gracious and God's in control. Those are That's a winning combination right there. Well, as I think about this, that does not endorse sin. That endorses your God. Okay? This has nothing to do about you. It has everything to do about Him. You know, in God's gracious control, He can utilize shallow men who naturally chase the pleasures of a corrupt world. Where do, what do we find going on here? Well, we, we come and you notice that we have a bit of a uh, transition, chapter 2, after these things. That's always an indicator that some time has passed. Actually, as we come into this, we find out that there has been a span of nearly four years that is, uh, we, we've got a, I'll explain that more in a, in a bit, but Queen Vashti has been set aside. Probably as many as four years have passed between the beginning of chapter 1 and into chapter 2. The secular history relates that Xerxes carried a campaign against Greece and he miserably, miserably was defeated. In fact, his entire navy, the Persian navy, sunk. That's a bad day. Uh, they, they were destroyed at the Adriatic Sea. Uh, we're told that um, between a storm and a battle that didn't go well for them, totally took out the entire Persian Navy. At, if that weren't good enough uh, to make for a bad day, um, he also, also tried to take out the Greeks and was humiliated in 480 um, at Palatia in 479. So in 480, the navy was defeated at Salamis, also known as the Adriatic Sea, that area. Um, but he was humiliated, his army was, in 479. And you might be asking, why is he after Greece? Well, his dad never lost a single battle. But... Greece beat him. And he's like, it's, it's time to go back. Do you remember our feast we have talked about earlier? It was probably trying to build national, uh, get the temperature up to attack Greece. So they're building all this momentum. They go after Greece. That's what's going on in the secular world at this time. He, what does it say in your text? It says in chapter 2, so in his anger, his wrath has subsided. Uh, third phrase, he remembered Vashti. Now the word remembered here is generally used of affectionate reflection. He, he's reflecting on Vashti. I'm like, oh, it was nice when I had a wife. You know, Vashti probably, I don't know, this conjecture on my part, I wish I had a comforter right now. And he's probably thinking, huh. Oh, I know of someone who actually comforted me. It was that the wife I banished. <laughs> you know? And so there's some probable regret. The text doesn't give us whether there's regret or not. It feels that way. But um, we don't want to go farther than the text either. So we look at this looking for comfort likely. But you know what? Without God, this world starves for companionship for comfort, for peace. But you know what the world does? It resorts to shallow, superficial, momentary comforts. Because they can't tie eternity into it. They can't tie God into it because faith is not the mode of operandum that they have. All they can see is the temporal pleasures and men chase fleeting pleasures and sins. What the king does makes sense if this world is your only hope. You know, as, the, as we come into this, verse 2, we see that uh, someone, the wizards of smart come along, and the king's servants, okay, so his personal attendants. Now, if you hear me use Xerxes or Ahasuerus, it's the same guy, okay? Um, now, there's three different Xerxes. That's a title that the, the Greeks use. Ahasuerus would be the Hebrew word, same guy, so don't get confused. So, the king's servants, his attendants, who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Oh, what a great idea. All of a sudden they're like, this is it. We'll throw. It sounds like a beauty pageant because that's what we have in our culture. But this is the problem. This is not some contest that's innocent. It's conscription. 
It is. These ladies are almost to the point you could almost use the word abducted. They're taken from homes. Can you imagine? So this goes out. According to Jewish historians, we find that Josephus and others record that some 400 women were expected that were actually collected for this. It actually matched also, Herodias also says that he had a house of concubine of 360 women. Did you notice in our text that if he didn't delight in you, you would never see the king again, but you lived in the second house for the rest of your life. Okay, so you become, if you would, a plaything for the king. Horrible. This is an ugly chapter. Sad. It's tragic. It's dehumanizing. Remember, this is... A the people of God are in a captive foreign country with an ungodly, wicked king who is a Zoastrian with all kinds of pluralistic tendencies that probably pulled in uh, 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 Marduk and other gods from Babylon and a collection of gods throughout the area. But he would clearly be a Zoastrian of what we know, which would be kind of the seedbed of thought for most of the Eastern religions that uh, we have today out in, in Asia. But... Trying to, and which would be Eastern thought, would be escaping the material because the material is bad. So, for what that's worth, that's so Astrianism in a nutshell. Um, beauty treatments, purification was to be given. Okay. How come? So, you ever think about this? It's not good enough that you get the cutest gals in the whole kingdom. But what do you have to do to them? Beauty treatments. How long? 12 months. <laughs> That's some serious beauty treatments, ladies. Um, so, um, can you imagine? Probably in our world, pedicures and all that, like, and, and all that, the, the, all the prettiness, you know, you know, just all dolled up for six, for 12 months straight, just getting this. They actually would use perfuming oils. Uh, this doesn't sound cool to me, but they would take myrrh and they'd have these burners, historically we find, and it matches some of the language of our text that would be uh, fumigating the women. <laughs> That's my, my understanding of this, but it was considered purification. It, uh, softening of the skin, all kinds. I mean, this is before there was, you know, all those fan luberdim and fancy kind of dove soaps and, and stuff. They They've got dove down thousands of years ago. That's what the king's doing, okay? But only the king's got access, it feels like, to this. I mean, he's got a huge budget for this. This is all going on, beauty treatments. The word has the idea of to polish. Um, and so he's putting on a polish, if you would. You know what the sad thing is with this? It's, it's all external. They're... Those who are fixated on looks, beauty, you know what the Bible calls them? Beauty is what? Vain. Beauty is vain. Uh, young people, teenagers, junior hires, young people coming up, singles, adults, all of you. Remember this. A great quote. I heard this on the radio. I don't know who said it. We look in a mirror, but we gaze at Christ. The Christian gazes at Jesus, not ourselves. It's vanity to always be pensively looking at this and fixated on what we look like, who we're going to win over, what it might be like. Could you be a little more natural maybe if you're vain? Can you surrender this to God and say, God, help me to gaze at you, not on myself. You see, beauty is a stewardship. It's a gift from God. And be careful of the thing, well, I don't like the way I look. I'm too short or I'm too uneven, not right, you know. I mean, all those things bug people, don't they? I mean, we know it. And so you look in the mirror and you're like, man... That's just not quite right. But you know what? One ear's smaller than the other. Who cares? Um, who's checking those out anyway? But when we, we think about Jesus, we don't want to be vain about ourselves. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, what? Do all for what? The glory of God. 
Staring at the mirror is not to the glory of God. Gazing at the mirror is not to the glory of God. Selfies constantly to see what you look like. You know what? It'd be all right if you have a messed up hair day. It's okay. You know, it's okay to be human. All right? I don't care what you look like when it comes... I mean, be modest. I care about modesty. Because that matters. I don't care what people come into our church looking like or, or how we interact. As long as they, you know, cover what's necessary and just be people. Love people. You know what I mean? And you be a person who models just being a person. You know what I mean? Be careful of vanity. Well, I, uh, I appreciate this. Matthew Henry said this, even as masterpieces of nature. So you got the most be beautiful girls in the kingdom. They ha must have all this help from the arts he used, uh, cosmetic arts, that is, to recommend them to a vain and carnal mind. End of quote, Matthew Henry. I appreciate that. Because... When I look at King Ahasuerus, I do not see a godly man. I see a pagan king who is vain. He is easily angered. This man would get so mad. When he lost his navy, I'm not sure if it was this time or another time, he got mad at the ocean or the sea, and he started whipping the ocean to punish it. I mean, this guy blew his top. He didn't just banish a queen. He was known at just losing his temper. He's vain. He's about showing off his wife to a bunch of drunk guys when she's the only woman in the room and there's all these drunk guys and it's day seven of the drunken feast. The guy is all about himself. He's vain. He's showy. Christian, don't think that being showy will end in just innocence. It leads you toward worldliness. What is worldliness? Worldliness is adopting the value system of this world. There's nothing wrong with looking nice. You can look nice to the glory of God or you can look nice to the glory of you. One is righteous, one's a sin. Be careful of what you do. This is a story of redemption and grace. Notice, uh, oh, there's so much here. We kind of covered that. Verse 3, um, we covered, let's look in verse 4. Verse 4, we see that then let young women who pleases the king, let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. What a great plan. This thing pleased the king. Um, the word pleased her, it appealed to the king, and he did so. He followed it. So, I mean, I, just an observation. I find the king very, he often goes to council. Uh, and counsel can be wise or it can be foolish. Uh, I'm not sure, but it has a where I feel like a, a finger is in the air some of the time. It, it's making sense as I go through this narrative. You just test that and see if that matches this man or not. Well, I do want to read uh, from 1 John 2.15. Uh, and so, and that is not on the, so turn, hold your spot here. Turn to 1 John 2.15. End of your Bibles before Revelation. You have the epistles of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd. We want 1 John chapter 2. Verse 15 and 16. Church, remember this. Friend, brother and sister in Christ, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is, it, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Isn't that King Ahasuerus as we come through? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, vanity at pride of life. That is what's characterizing him. He's looking for comfort in these things. 
You know, sin is pleasurable for a season, and we just get another fix in the pride of life. We get another fix of being a little more proud. We get another fix of being a little more vain, being a little more lustful. This is a man who is incredible. He's not only immoral in our Bible, but even secular Herodias and other the Greeks even record this man was incredibly immoral during this time. It's recorded on world history. If you had picked up People magazine of that day, that's what it was saying at the time. And, and from the Bible, we know it's actually true. And I'm not endorsing that, that garbage by any means. But moving on, um, you know, I want to ask this. The world turns to shallow stuff. But girls, how are you... You ever get the temptation to be popular? Be careful. Um, if you have the temptation to be popular with the boys at school or in the sports arena or where you gather or whatnot, do you know what compromise will be required of you to be popular? Christians are... In, are invited to compromise with the world's on the world's terms. Be careful of what terms are setting your fellowship with this world. What values you're adopting. And I, and I borrow that from Pastor Terry um, Johnson, which was George Murdoch's old pastor, had a good sermon on this. You know, today, less than ideal situations in family life. You know, in God's gracious control, he can utilize less than ideal situations. Look at this in chapter 2, verse 5 through 7. As we look there... <clears throat> In Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, and the, the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, the ben, a Benjamite. So this Kish, is, he was carried off with um, uh, Jeconiah. Uh, Jehoi, his, he has about three different names, but one of the kings of, of Israel, this would, I think, like 590s when this goes, goes back. And uh, so the early part of the captivity... <laughs> He was carried off with. And remember, Mordecai and Esther are cousins. So this is the line of the family that they have come from. Uh, we see something else that just kind of tugs at your heart. Verse 7. Um, he brought up Hadessa. Hadessa is the Hebrew name for Esther. Esther is a Persian name. Uh, Esther means uh, star, and uh, Hadassa means myrtle, uh, which is a fragrance. And so that's uh, what we say. And, and myrtle flowers have almost the resemblance of a flower. And so it's, I might wonder if uh, just it was kind of a Persian kind of knockoff to her Hebrew name. Don't entirely know. Uh, but Esther is also the name of a, a foreign god, Ishtar, and so which means star. So... They definitely renamed the Hebrews after their gods. In fact, Mordecai is named after Marduk, which was a Babylonian god as well as one in Persia. So just a little bit of nerdiness there for you. We go on, but we see this that in verse 7, that what's happened to Esther's folks? They're, they passed away at a young age. So basically, he's adopted her, his cousin, taken her into the home. You know what? This is not ideal. You know what? How much of the time do we say things like this? How could God be in this mess? This is so ugly. This is so hard. How could someone lose their parent? How about both parents? In a foreign country, the temple of God has been destroyed. The people of God were slaughtered a hundred years ago. Things are rough. Zerubbabel is back in the land trying to rebuild things. And they have to fight for each square inch as, as you look at by time you look at Nehemiah to build the wall, just a simple wall around the city. Things are hard for the people of God. You know what? Newsflash. Things have always been hard for the people of God. Jesus promised it. The Old Testament is full of it. The New Testament is full of it. We, we have to stop believing the lie that everything needs to be cushy in order to be good. No, 
Good is defined by are you growing in perseverance? Are you growing in patience, endurance? That's what the purpose of trials are. As you look at Romans 5 as well as James 1. Well, uh, looking on a little bit here, Mordecai comes up 58 times in the book. This is the first mention of him. And uh, uh, as we look at this uh, man, we don't know of him having a wife, verse 7, or family, but we do know that uh, he does have access to the women's quarters, verse 11. Uh, maybe that is because he's a eunuch, or maybe it's because he's a high government official. Don't know the answer, but he has access. Okay, here's a question. So, during World War II, you know the story of Corey Ten Boom. What did they do in their house? And what did a lot of believers do during that time? They, they hid Jews in little walls and compartments of their house, stowed them away, kept, kept them out of sight. And you ask the question, was it possible in that day to hide Esther? <laughs> was it possible, like, if you know the, the king was going to come around and steal your best-looking daughter, if you would, and take her away to be immoral with the king, a pagan, ungodly, uncircumcised man, and then just be part of his huge huge harem, never to have a family potentially, the odds are so much against her, and to be an ungodly, wicked, forbidden, I mean, and this is a problem, mixed marriages at this time are huge in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, which are written at the same time, when these three books are overlapping here, and you look like, man, Maybe the people of God are really... No, the people of God were really compromised. Read Ezra and Nehemiah. They were horribly compromised in this area. So we've got to be careful who we date, who we marry, who we link up with. These things are some things to keep us in mind as we go through this book. Not all of our heroes have perfect uh, you know, backgrounds. You know, we do remember though that in Proverbs 21.1 that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like rivers of water he turns it wherever he wishes. Um, God doesn't force a hazardous to accept the plan or nor does God approve of his harems or his sensual abuse of women, as Warren Wiersbe says, it simply means that without being the author of sin, God so directed the people in the situation that decisions were made uh, to accomplish God's purposes. We see that God is doing this to save thousands of Jewish people from uh, a huge slaughter. And that is going to come up more as we go through the account. Well, keep in mind, compromised believers, even in compromised scenarios. God is still gracious. God is still in control. Well, you look in, in chapter 2, verse 8 through 16, and we come into this, and we see that the decree goes out. He loves the idea. Um, Esther also is taken as the king's palace, the end of verse 8. And so, she's overlooked, has all these treatments, verse 9, but we see that she obtained favor. You know, I think, and not only was she beauty and form and appearance, but you notice how she finds favor with everyone that's around her? What's attractive? You know what's really attractive? Humility. Godly servants. Godliness is attractive. Ladies and guys, do you want to be really attractive biblically? Grow it in here. Turn to 1 Peter, if you would. 1 Peter chapter 3. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste, your pure conduct. Pure. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful when someone's just genuinely pure? God's like, that is precious in my sight. Do not, oh, and accompanied by fear, that is respect, a, a reverence, an honor. Do not let your adornment, your, your jewelry and everything else merely be outward. Arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Notice that when, when Esther goes into the king's presence, she doesn't take everything. She doesn't loot the jewelry boxes of the king to come into his presence. Instead, she takes counsel from Haggai. 
And he's like, this is what the king fight. And she abides by what he mentions. And so she goes into his presence. And the king delights in that. Meanwhile, all the other ladies are like, huh, you mean I get to walk in with that purse? With that on? With this? Whatever happens to me? And they get dolled up, smelling stronger than, I don't know, that maybe the whole bottle just got dumped on them? I don't know. You know, some people's discretion's a little off. But whatever it happened to be, they came in, didn't impress the king at all. You know what? Verse 4, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with an incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. There is nothing more beautiful than gentleness, humility. And God's like, this is very precious in my sight. Ladies, do you want to be stunningly beautiful for God? Let it be gentleness. Let it be a sweetness, a, a surrender that says, God, you are big enough for every problem I will ever have. I can be gentle in this response. I can respond with, with a satisfaction, a quiet spirit, a stilled, calm spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. And so that's just something to keep in mind as we look in our text. Well... This is all unfolding. In verse 10, Esther had not revealed her people or family. Is this more? We don't know why. Verse 11, and every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare. So we see all of this unfolding. Um, before the king. And one of the things that you I have to remember, Rich Van Heuchelum shared this. People don't deserve to be used. Often they're used to preserve, but God will allow people to sin to accomplish even his promises. Does that God's not complicit. He allowed you to do what you wanted to do. He allowed wicked people to do what they want to do because God's not making us robots. And, um, but you know, at the same time, you and I can't be okay to get to the top by compromising our standards. We have to be careful. You know, there was an athlete years ago who was going, he looked like the next Mickey Mantle. They gave him a $4 million sign-on bonus, but he couldn't handle $4 million. He never actually played. He got the money, never played baseball. Because $4 million of luxury living killed him before he ever got to play the first game. You know, we look at lives like that of tragedy you use the world's standards and you don't pursue God's ways. There are sins that lead unto death. We're told that in the New Testament. So we need to be careful. We guard ourselves from foolishness. You know, I'm going to stop there because it went really fast. So we will pick this up in a couple weeks. I apologize about that. Um, but as uh, we kind of bring things to close, I want to uh, share one application. Is be careful of compromising opportunities to obey God. And are there some that you're doing? Are you, where are you compromising? And then another thing is, what's your standard of beauty? Are you gazing at Christ or are you gazing at yourself? Let's pray. Lord God, would you please help us to be your stewards? Help us to love you. Lord, help us not to compromise our standards, to be popular, to be vain, to be empty, to be gloating about ourselves. Lord, our boast is in Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to rather boast in Him. Help us to rather say, I want to make God big in all things. Lord, help us to have a gentle spirit. Lord, guide us to be individuals who have a godly tenor and life that brings people to the attractiveness of Jesus instead of things that point to our body, to the vanity of this world, and the like. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good and a godly week.